Okay, it's gone one o'clock. So I am about to get started. So Francesca Curtis is a PhD candidate in history of art at the University of York. Her research investigates the relationship between the structures of ecology and globalization in depictions of the ocean since the 1960s, achieved through an exploration of relationality in systems, land, and moving image mediums. Her paper, The Slow Violence of Climate Breakdown, was published in The Ecologist in April 2019. Her paper today is titled, Here Now, Everywhere Always, Ocean Landmark and the Spatio-Temporal Conditions of Ecological Breakdown. Okay, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you today. Um, so I will be speaking to you about a site-specific work called Ocean Landmark, as you can see from my title. Um, and this is by the North American artist Betty Beaumont. So this is taken from my PhD thesis, which explores questions of what it means to be global today by moving away from the dominant financial and market-based concepts of the global to one that is more ecologically inclined. So this is so that we consider difference, not only between humans and animals and plants and entire ecosystems, but between humanity itself. And such relationality is guided by notions of care, compassion, and a respect to otherness. So it must be stressed that my work is not really about climate change in this respect and that I rarely discuss climate, but rather climate change and the ecological crisis more generally are motivations for thinking through these ideas. The model of relationality I argue for is in direct response to the development of neoliberal global capital that causes extreme ecological damage by exploiting, commodifying, and colonizing life forms. I hope that today I can offer a sense of art history that can be used to think through these questions that are becoming increasingly pressing for our time. So between 1978 and 1980, Betty Beaumont created her most well-known environmental artwork, Ocean Landmark an artificial reef on the Atlantic continental shelf, three miles off the coast of Fire Island, New York. This reef consisted of 17,000 rectangular blocks constructed from 500 tons of recycled coal ash, which were transported from a power plant in Ohio, shipped to a concrete block making factory in Pennsylvania, and then transported to the Jersey shore before Beaumont transported them by tugboat out into the Atlantic. As a $3 million project funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, the US Department of Energy and the America the Beautiful Fund, it is a project resulting from collaboration with multiple scientific and industrial institutions, some of which I have for you on the screen here. Um, the intention was to simultaneously combat the damaging effects of overfishing and toxic waste in ocean space and the non-renewability and the high levels of waste produced in the coal industry by stabilizing the coal waste in water as blocks, which would form a reef for the marine ecosystem. Using research into the stability of coal waste in water then being explored at the Marine Science Research Center the project now certainly seems like a risk, but it is one that paid off, as the reef has now been acknowledged as a fish haven by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Beaumont's practice is most readily classed as ecological art. This subsection of environmental artistic practice was retrospectively um, distinguished from the prominent land art movement by curator Barbara Matilski at the Fragile Ecologies exhibition at Queen's Museum in 1992. Beaumont's practice um, was exhibited alongside major artworks of the ecological art movement, 
some of whose exhibited artworks I have for you on the screen here. Ecological art was defined as a practice that not only remediated damaged land, but did so with an emphasis on the well-being of incurred systems and a problem-solving methodology, rather than on the mere treatment of the environment as a material. Ocean Landmark is regarded as one of the first site-specific remediation projects of the ecological arts movement and has rarely been given attention outside of its ecological aims. Indeed, the framework of ecological art often seems to merely confirm how artists can be useful to the current ecological crisis, either through enacting material changes to ecosystems or the transformation of social values. This idea resonates strongly today and is evident in this 2019 Days Digital article, The Artists, Activists Who Predicted the Climate Crisis, which brought Beaumont's practice very briefly back into the public eye through its solution-based sustainable strategies. So throughout my research into ocean landmark and the land art genre, I became increasingly dissatisfied with this categorization of ecological art in overwhelmingly utilitarian terms. This is not to dispute the positive effect that ocean landmark has had on the ecosystem nor is it to suggest that art, and indeed art history, cannot be useful for conceptualising today's ecological crisis. Rather, it is my contention that the focus on the mere facts of ecological remediation artworks, like Ocean Landmark, have deprived the works of the conceptual richness that has been accorded to the land art genre since the early 1960s. With prominent art historians such as um, Rosalind Krauss conceiving land art in terms of phenomenology, post-structuralism, and the deterritorialization and globalization of art, ecological artworks like Ocean Landmark seem devoid of conceptual potential in comparison. But this is far from the case. And using Ocean Landmark as a key example, it is my intention to illustrate that ecological art has much to offer and not only to the land art discourse. Treating these works less as products of land management and rather as complex, conceptually rich interrogations of the ecological, the questions become, what notion of ecology does it produce? What does it suggest about the relationship between the human and non-human worlds? and perhaps most importantly, how the answers to these questions, guided by geopolitical, biopolitical, sociopolitical, and eco-political conditions, not only of today, but as they have changed in the past 40 years. This last question reinforces the now often acknowledged claim that a concept of nature cannot be separated from global capitalism, or indeed culture or society. Such a relationship is also illustrated in the very realization of Ocean Landmark, as I have described it to you, through the intense collaboration of arts, ecosystems, and industrial and governmental institutions. To focus purely on the ecological would ignore the ways in which the work, and indeed environmentalism more generally, operates through corporate and political means. Acknowledging this can easily and rightly question Ocean Landmark's relationship to what environmentalist Joshua Carliner has termed corporate environmentalism in his 1997 text, The Corporate Planet. For Carliner, corporate environmentalism refers to the ways in which ecological concerns are incorporated by transnational corporations reconciling their profit-driven ideologies in line with the realities of ecological destruction. This practice peaked by the end of the millennium and the, as the industrial, uh, as the environmental industry had become what Kyliana terms a group of toxic hauling, wastewater cleaning, air pollution scrubbing corporations that is a global giant in its own right. What epitomizes corporate environmentalism is the emphasis not on building clean materials in themselves, 
but on what Carliner terms the end of the pipe strategies to contain hazardous waste, which do not eliminate the problem, but rather displace it. By focusing on the material consequences of ocean landmark, rather than on the conceptual or interpretive potential of its material condition, it is in danger of falling into this corporate environmentalist trait. Yet such a focus does not leave room for the potential for the work to be self-reflexively critical, an interrogation into the very practices it replicates. As a result, I want to share with you what one such critical conceptual approach to ocean landmark may be, which is an examination into the work's relationship to space and time on local and global scales. Ocean Landmark adopts a prominent feature of land art, the site non-site paradigm. While the site refers to the work as it exists outside of the gallery, the non-site refers to the various methods of documentation that are exhibited in the gallery space as a substitute for the site. So Beaumont has created and planned a significant number of non-sites for Ocean Landmark. And you can see on the right here how it was exhibited at the Fragile Ecologies exhibition. So alongside sculpture, which you can see on the left, film and underwater photography, Beaumont planned numerous software-based programs, such as Decompression from 2000, which is an assemblage of visual and sonic media, including satellite imagery, which I have for you here, but also sonograms, side scan sonar imagery, and underwater audio recordings of biological growth, water tones, and fish noises. Decompression was then to develop into living laboratory, or what Beaumont terms a thriving information system in cyberspace, aiming to educate its users not only of the sculpture itself, but its wider connection to the politics of the ocean environmental contamination and feminism. While neither decompression nor living laboratory were realized, she did produce two elements of this grand project. One of which, titled Ocean Landmark VR ML World, was an art and technology collaboration using virtual reality technology to reconstruct the underwater sculpture. So the viewer watches these blocks fall and then they can navigate the space around them. So in many ways, the focus on the non-sites can be seen to make up for the invisibility of the site itself, which can only be accessed with the appropriate diving equipment and training. Yet Beaumont's emphasis on the relationship between the site and the non-site is not merely a necessary development of documentation, but rather she multiplies the site into a whole host of forms, existing in different times and spaces, including the underwater world and the virtual world and the imagination. Ocean landmark is thus no longer a singular object, but always fragmented and multiple. You might say it's its own art system, its own assemblage, or even its own ecology. You might say that it also reinforces a concept of deterritorialization, used by globalization discourses to explain the heightened mobility of goods, money, people, information, and ideas on a global scale. David Harvey's concept of time-space compression is evoked, which maintains that space has been destroyed by time in postmodernity through the seeming instantaneity of accelerated production and consumption and the ephemerality of a rising image culture. It may appear with its emphasis on making the site of ocean landmark knowable through media, that its site non-site paradigm is perfectly suited for a global condition with access to the elsewhere through the flows of a world system. Except it's not really. Site specificity, as it is conceived by Miron Kwan, frames, is framed as a reaction to the conditions of deterritorialization. The politics of localized space is in fact reinforced by site specificity for Kwan, whose emphasis on space 
seeks to hi highlight that space is constructed by capitalism. Ocean Landmark is not devoid of a political interrogation into space. The reef's existence in the ocean may suggest a kind of placelessness through its inaccessibility, but its position in the continental shelf, which is an exclusive economic zone of ocean space rather than in the high seas, illustrates the ways in which the ocean has been territorialized by governments in order to allow for corporations to exploit the sea's resources. Indeed, the post-war era saw the major militarization of the seas. And one of the ways in which the sea is used is through toxic dumping, which not only echoes the ways in which the ocean has long been associated with ideas of waste, but signifies a form of waste imperialism as countries in the global north look to those in the global south to store their waste in exchange for debt relief. With its collaboration with the coal industry, Ocean Landmark is in direct conversation, not only with those who question the presumption that the land of land art is a neutral term, but with the global operations of waste removal that has only exacerbated since the militarization of the sea. Secondly, it would be a mistake to think that through the non-sites, the site of Ocean Landmark is instantly knowable. Despite my interest in the work, I acknowledge that I will most likely never see the site itself, even though it still exists, nor will I ever experience decompression or living laboratory precisely because they have never existed. If the viewer's relationship to the site of Ocean Landmark through the non-sites is to refer to models of global connection, it is not achieved through the seamless and instantaneous flows of information, images, and ideas across space. Rather, it is a system that is ultimately broken and unstable. But this is by far a weakness of the work. The insistence on the invisibility of the site um, offers um, a notion of situatedness by Donna Haraway who uses vision as a means of describing the humanistic aim of epistemological transcendence through militaristic technology. The fact that Ocean Landmark remains elsewhere reinforces that I am here, situated and embodied, with limitations to what I see, think and know. So rather than through forms of visual domination, I rather posit a different kind of connection to the site of Ocean Landmark. The work's watery existence is by far a hindrance to concepts of connectivity, rather it incites its own. By inviting a relationship to water, the site pervades sp fixed spatial boundaries. According to Estrida Neymanis's post-human phenomenology, Water is transcorporeal because it exists in every living entity. She argues that, and I quote, our wet matters are in constant process of intake, transformation and exchange, drinking, peeing, sweating, sponging, weeping. So the wateriness of our bodies not only connects humans to other humans, but to a world beyond the human or what Neymanis calls a more than human hydrocommons that extends beyond spatial proximity. Hence, while the site of Ocean Landmark is localised, it is by no means beyond embodied experience, because the very waters that surround the blocks are connected to the water in my body, in my tap, in the polar ice caps. It also extends beyond temporal proximity, as the world's water is recycled so that the water in my body was also the precondition of life since the beginning of life on Earth and will continue to be so way beyond my own lifespan. Such an analysis of Ocean Landmark does not remove emphasis on the local or the embodied and its geopolitical implications. Rather, it reformulates spatial temporality to hold on to the here and now as well as the everywhere and always. So in this way, we can find in Ocean Landmark a relational model of the local and the global, 
not based on the overwhelmingly financial world, but on embodied material existence. It is in this space that ecology and globalization collide. The political power of Neymanis' transcorporeality comes in both the dual recognition of what it means to be a porous ecological subject and what this means for the current condition of global capital, which intensely exploits the bodies of living entities. To speak of porous bodies is to speak of contamination, which is something we are all too familiar with at the minute. But it reminds us that an indirect connection with ocean landmark is an indirect connection with a formerly toxic substance. You might think of oil spills, plastic pollution, or ocean acidification, all of which point to a global water system that, for us, is becoming increasingly unstable. So it is at this point that we can turn to climate change. No doubt if the ocean was a starting point for life on Earth, then the future is becoming increasingly aqueous. Through Ocean Landmark, I have attempted to illustrate how ecological site-specific art contributes far more than its utilitarian function. Inciting questions of space and time can force us to conceive of how climate change is a global condition, but with geopolitical injustices, as those that pollute the least often suffer the most, either through location or a lacking economic infrastructure. Art history is thus presented with an ethical question of what potential lies in artistic practice that can allow us to comprehend climate change as, amongst other things, a geopolitical condition. As artworks on a very basic level are, are, are objects in space, it must be addressed what this really means within the framework of ecological breakdown. Thank you. Anna McLaughlin was trained as an artist, disciplined in environmental studies and Hatha yoga, and has delighted in geography. She is a learner, teacher, researcher, writer, and carer, who currently holds an honorary research position at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And her paper today is titled Grappling with the Glasgow Effect, Exploding Art World and Academic Success Fantasies and is perhaps going to offer one way to think about how art can move beyond capitalism's material ghosts. Um, so uh, the floor is Anna's. Hiya, this is Anna McLaughlin. Today I'm grappling with the Glasgow effect, exploding art world and academic success fantasies. Massive thanks to Ellie Harrison and Rebecca Wilcox for commenting on this presentation and to Ellie Harrison for generously supplying images. Ellie sent me this picture of chips. On 28th October 2015, Ellie bought those chips from the Philadelphia Fish and Chicken Bar in Great Western Road, Glasgow, then photographed the chips and ate them. What might that feel like? What is the phenomenological experience? The chips are fried in animal fat. After swallowing the chips, the fat furs in your mouth. Coke or iron brew can help rinse the fur away. This picture was used as the Facebook image representing the Glasgow effect, an artwork in which the artist and activist Ellie Harrison did not travel outside the city of Glasgow, Scotland, for the whole of 2016. This artwork borrows its title from the name given to a mystery. Why do people die younger in Glasgow than in similar post-industrial UK cities, such as Manchester and Liverpool? The title's invocation of Glasgow's poor health record, the £15,000 funding from the public body supporting the arts, Creative Scotland, and the chips hit a nerve that led to Facebook outrage. Why had a middle-class English artist been given 15k to voluntarily trap herself in Glasgow when so many others never have the chance to leave? Facebook's geographically local outrage led the Glasgow effect to trend 
projecting it into the UK press. The article on the left from the Daily Record features local rapper Loki, who states, it's horrendously crass to parachute someone in on a poverty safari when local authorities are cutting finance to things like music tuition for Scotland's poorest kids. The coverage, as with much of the Facebook response, was preoccupied by the £15,000. Ellie's 2019 book, The Glasgow Effect, A Tale of Class, Capitalism and Carbon Footprint, documents the escalating online and media reaction folded into a confessional autobiography and retrospective of her art career. Ellie conceives this part of the work as a homage to After All's One Work series. After All specialised in taking one work of art by one artist and producing an essential critical guide to it. As the book, and now Ellie's website, state, the book provides the complete context for her thinking and action. The Facebook mob demanded context. Why not give them it all? And that context includes a detailed emotional response to the city in which she was living. Importantly, a great deal of the press about the book, including the Sunday Times article, picked up on the broader point, highlighting Ellie's prescient thinking about the need to move away from private vehicles in favour of walking, cycling and better public transport. The title's reference to Glasgow suggests a local remit, but the carbon footprint of the subtitle positions this project as concerned with the global problem of climate change. The Glasgow effect was a response to Ellie's own unsustainable lifestyle choices, evident in the central illustration of the book, a graph, tons of carbon produced by the personal transportation of a professional artist. Emissions steadily rise from the inception of Ellie's art career in 2004, with spikes in years with international air travel. Ellie's increasing success as an artist is accompanied by increasing emissions. Ellie began the project because the University of Dundee, to which the art school where she works is affiliated, required her to write and submit a significant research grant application. Her original plan for the project was to highlight the absurdity of her own commuter lifestyle, similar to many young academics. Living in one city, Glasgow, and working in another, Dundee, she wanted to enact the opposite of the art world in academia's obsession with internationalisation. As her sister identified, this would be a brilliant challenge to the unnecessary pressures on staff to fundraise, a great practical joke. She was questioning the basis of academic success. Would the art school sack her? That's what happened to critically engaged artists John Latham and Joseph Boyce when they simil similarly chose not to compromise their personal principles. The Glasgow effect is clearly placed and arguably site specific. Mi Won Kwon's writing from the late 90s and early 2000s notes, site specific art initially took the site as an actual location, a tangible reality. Importantly, the reality prioritized was the one here and now, the bodily presence of each viewing subject. Quan conceives this as a dramatic reversal to the modernist placeless object that could be moved from gallery to gallery with its meaning allegedly unsullied by context. Site-specific work was initially formally directed or determined by its environment. To abbreviate Quan's appraisal of several decades of art history, site comes to be thought of as phenomenological, remember the chips, social, institutional and discursive. These are competing definitions, overlapping with one another and operating simultaneously in various cultural practices today, or even within a single artist's single project. These phenomenological, social, social institutional and discursive understandings of sight can help demonstrate the role of the Glasgow effect as an intervention into art world and academic success fantasies. This talk is hosted by the Courtauld Institute of Art, 
a centre for the study of art history. I now discursively summon two social institutional sites from the Glasgow effect relevant to the here and now, the cultural framework of conceptual art and the artwork's role as a critical intervention into the academy. These social institutional sites take the form of projections into an internationalised or global arena through employing but also questioning measures of success within these arenas. The artwork that encompasses the book explodes art world and academic success fantasies. That is, it draws attention to them, pulls the rug from underneath them and offers a destabilising challenge for how we negotiate the structures constraining our day-to-day -day lives. So I'll begin with the cultural framework of conceptual art. Is it a global projection? The Glasgow effect draws from a conceptual line lineage, as is evident from the instructional form of the statement of intent. As the Facebook page says, a year long action research durational performance for which Ellie Harrison will not travel outside Greater Glasgow. This limit to travel area was coupled by another on travel mode, a refusal to use any vehicle except a bike. Importantly, Ellie's instruction is a vow that limits her own movement, but publicness being online, the act of demonstrating this vow intends to make other people reflect on and change their own behaviour. Ironically, four years later, a large part of the world has been following similar, if not more draconian instruction as a result of the management of COVID-19. The Glasgow Effect, as an action research durational performance, follows Lucy Lippard's definition of conceptual art in her self-confessed biased history, six years, the dematerialisation of the art object. Lippard conceived conceptual art between 1966 and 72 as an independent or alternative art that could not be bought or sold, subverting the understanding of art as commodity. This direction for conceptual art is still evident 40 years later in Claire Bishop's writing concerning an artistic orientation towards the social since the 1990s. Bishop posits the art she surveys is driven by a shared set of desires to overturn the traditional relationship between the art object, the artist and the audience. This continuity from Lippard into Bishop, together with the relevance to the Glasgow effect, is palpable in Bishop's statement that the overview she presents contains work with an aim to place pressure on conventional modes of artist artistic production and consumption under capitalism. A lot has happened since Lippard's designation of conceptual art, but importantly, Lippard's text discusses the artist and communication and tacitly expresses another nascent now enduring feature of conceptual art, a projected audience for or consumption of art that is internationalised, if not global. This is evident in Lippard's use of a quote from Challenger of an institutionalised art world of museums and galleries, Seth Seaglub. Communication relates to art in three ways. One, art is knowing what other artists are doing. Two, the art community knowing what artists are doing. Three, the world knowing what artists are doing. It is my concern to make it known to multitudes. The most suitable means are books and catalogues. Zieglib's championing and empowering of artists had the effect of taking them out of the institutions like museums and galleries, and making them relevant for a projected global audience, expressing the possibility that there is, in human terms, a universal relevance to the work. Arguably, this is a state of art and many other things now. That is, it is made in response to an imagined globality or universalism. That projection of assumed globality may be shared both by the producer and the audience, although they may understand something slightly different by it. This points to tensions in any ambition to place pressure on conventional modes of artistic production and consumption under capitalism, because the assumed globality or international relevance of the work is part of what makes it marketable, makes it successful. The Glasgow Effect, in homage to Patrick Geddes, had the working title Think Global, Act Local. 
The internationalised, if not global, outlook is evident both in this framing and the associated funding application to create in Scotland that was written in 2015. Firstly, Think Global, Act Local is an artwork in its own right, a durational performance in the tra tradition of great works by Lee Lozano and Te Ching Se. It offers significant long-term benefits to national and international audiences who experience it second-hand through lectures and writing in the future. Contributing to critical contemporary art discourse, it will develop our understanding of what sustainable practice actually means and challenge preconceived notions of what makes good career progression, all the while reflecting positively on the original site of its making, Glasgow, Scotland, as a centre for cultural activity. The statement contains a way we can evaluate the success of the work in its own terms. Arguably, funders demand such a globalised outlook. To be successful, such global positioning is needed. The response to the Facebook page publicising the Glasgow effect also expresses an assumed glo globality. The internet is understood to have global reach, although its audience is really highly specified. The audience for the Glasgow effect was initially geographically local, based in or associated with Glasgow, as the Glaswegian vernacular of the outrage suggests. It was the outrage from a local audience which led it to trend and projected it into the UK press. Thus the local audience's understanding or projection that the Glasgow effect was global made it become more than local. This was accelerated by the presence of local celebrity Loki, who was part of what he identifies as the angry mob on Facebook. Loki refers to the Glasgow effect in his own 2018 book, also called Poverty Safari, recognising merit in the project. A universalism is also embedded in aspects of Ellie's approach. Ellie has quantified her activities, rationalised her experience into numbers. This is evident in the book's central illustration, the graph, tons of carbon produced by the personal transportation of a professional artist. Artist, as already stated, increases in emissions parallel her increasing success as an artist. In 2016, the year of the Glasgow effect, carbon plummets to zero. This means that the Glasgow effect flips the accepted understanding of success. For it to be successful in, in its own terms requires an absence of data, no carbon from motorised travel. But re by relying on no data, the Glasgow effect performs the most profound dematerialisation. If transport, certainly in the UK, is officially recognised as the biggest contributor to climate change of all sectors of the economy, then this project enacts one solution – stop using motorised transportation. While acknowledging there's clearly a very fine line between the need to localise our economies and the need to preserve human rights and not veer into nationalism and fascism. Importantly, Ellie compiled the graph in 2019 when writing the book. Therefore, the dematerialisation was only fully realised through its materialisation in the bar chart. For success to be recognised, it must be documented, in this case in a book. The materialisation of a book also enhances the role of this artwork to become a reflexive critical intervention uh, into the academy or academia. As stated earlier, Ellie began the project because the University of Dundee, to which the art school where she works is affiliated, required her to write and submit a significant research grant application. However, if the grant was awarded, it would put the university in a catch-22, which would highlight the absurdity of their value systems. Either they could have the money, a £15,000 grant to list on a spreadsheet somewhere, showing how successful they had been, or they could have Ellie there actually teaching the students. The UK University's internationalisation agenda necessitates research, teaching and student recruitment from outside the UK, notably China. All this makes for more travel, more disconnection and more greenhouse gas emissions. A vast amount of seemingly essential activity associated with academia appears to tackle or be concerned about climate change while reinforcing systems that bring it into being. 
Coming back to the here and now, this Art, History and Climate Change Conference was moved online, making it a dramatically smaller event. Perhaps it is time to consider whether people travelling to discuss climate change is justifiable, or if there are other ways we can enable a dialogue. To sum up, conceptual art was positioned as a challenge to art as commodity, but there is a tension between this and its underpinning projection of globality, of flexibility that justifies carbon intensive lifestyles. Ideas are easy to transport around the world and people quickly follow. The Glasgow effect appears as an uncomfortable enactment of a dilemma or Ellie's allergic reaction to a common situation where people are routinely required to work within structures that perpetuate lifestyles that are the opposite of what must happen to tackle stress, excess travel and ultimately climate change. In relation to Ellie's position in the university, the overwhelming reaction to the project, although personally uncomfortable, inadvertently provides protection. It's every university's dream to have so much press coverage. Would it be possible to sack her in such conditions? Ellie has chosen not to include the project in her Research Excellence Framework submission. The university had no role in facilitating it. She took unpaid leave to undertake the project, living off the grant instead. The book of the Glasgow Effect functions like an annotated retrospective of her art career. Practically omitting this from her academic career history provides another thought-provoking dematerialisation. To consider the success of the Glasgow Effect in its own terms, I conclude by paraphrasing the text of the funding application. As a national and international audience, you are currently experiencing the Glasgow Effect second-hand through a lecture. This is a contribution to critical contemporary art discourse. Is it developing your understanding of what sustainable practice actually means? Does it challenge your preconceived notions of what makes good career progression? Thank you so much, Anna, uh, for that fantastic presentation. We are going to get started with our third panel of the day. And we're starting off with Kadambari Baxi. Um, and Kadambari is going to be playing a video work for us. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce Kadambari and then we'll get going with the video. So Kadambari Baxi is an architect, media artist, and educator based in New York. She is Professor of Practice in Architecture at Barnard College, Columbia University. Her architecture and media projects have been exhibited internationally, including at the Seoul Biennale of Architecture in 2019, at the Chicago Art Institute 2017, and Oslo Architecture Triennale in 2016. Her most recent work focuses on multimedia advocacy related to climate issues in architecture and visual arts, e.g. Air Drifts, a short film and exhibition on transboundary air pollution, and a new work in progress called Climate Dissonance. She is a founding member of the advocacy group WBYA, or Who Builds Your Architecture? Great, thank you. Can I can everyone see this? Yes. Okay, sure. I'll go ahead and play the video. Thank you, Theo, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, as Theo mentioned, I'm going to share a, a, a film, a video that's a work in progress, uh, and it's on uh, climate activism. It has um, it has two parts. Uh, the first one is on uh, uh, the UN Global uh, COP conferences, uh, the uh, global summits. And the second one is on a U uh, recent youth uh, climate lawsuit uh, that was based in the US. Uh, so hopefully I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thousands 
Citizens Rally in Warsaw at the March for Climate and Social Justice as the UN Climate Change Conference enters its second week. Thousands of people marched here in downtown Lima, Peru, to call for action on climate change. Among them, members of Peru's more than 50 indigenous communities. Global greenhouse gas emissions reach a record high. Hundreds march here in Doha, calling for climate negotiators to take urgent action to save the planet from catastrophic climate change. On Sunday, nearly 10,000 people formed a human chain. Thousands defied a protest ban and were tear gassed by police. 200 people were arrested. Inside the summit, over 100 heads of state are gathering for the first day of COP21. Thousands of climate activists marched here in Katowice, Poland on Saturday, calling for world leaders to do more to keep rising greenhouse gas emissions in check. Negotiations at the historic UN climate talks have been suspended after a protest by African nations. This comes two days after 100,000 people took to the streets of Copenhagen, calling on world leaders to tackle the climate crisis. Live from the UN Climate Summit in Bonn, Germany, this year it's known as the first Islands COP, with Fiji presiding over this year's summit. The event itself is being held in Bonn, Germany. Via Campesina, the world's largest federation of peasant and smallholder farmers, held what they called the Thousand Cancun's Global Day of Action for Climate Justice. Several thousand people took to the streets here in Cancun to march in protest of the summit. Thousands march in Morocco calling for climate justice as the UN climate talks enter their second week. Many here are fearing what will happen now that a climate change denier is heading to the White House. Listen to the people, not the polluters. That's the message from thousands of people calling for climate justice at COP17 here in Durban, South Africa, the 17th round of UN climate talks. It's an attempt to undo 20 years of work on a legally binding agreement. People are not in Copenhagen to bury the climate treaty. They are here to implement it. Do not destroy the international treaty. Abide by it and enlarge and deepen it. But do not dismantle it, because you will be dismantling the only legal framework the world has to make the polluters pay, to create a system in which we can start shifting for, from a fossil fuel-driven civilization to a renewable energy driven The United States is blessed with an abundance of all types of energy. The president wants to use our country's vast resources to create jobs at home, and create a competitive advantage that helps revitalize U.S. manufacturing. The president also wants to use our energy resources to benefit our allies and partners, to, pro to provide them greater energy security and prosperity. The, the chart. We are American, but we see right through your green. We're holding this event today because rich con industrialized countries have effectively held global action on climate change hostage. We have seen years of inaction on reducing emissions, on supporting developing countries and people to adapt. And now what we see, events like what we saw in Philippines, Typhoon Haiyan, the loss and damage is increasing and we don't see anything changing in these negotiations. And our political leaders have 
the temerity to tolerate the fact that we are called hooligans, when in fact the real hooligans are the CEOs and the big bosses of oil, coal and gas companies that have completely captured our governments and have completely captured this negotiating process. It is an insult to us that in fact this COP is largely sponsored by the coal industry. We strongly believe that no country should have to sacrifice economic prosperity or energy security in pursuit of environmental sustainability. The United States is now the number one combined oil and gas producer in the world. It is clear that in energy innovation and fossil fuels will continue to play a leading role. <laughs> energy access. I say to the UNFCC that in fact it is inappropriate and the UN cannot continue to pander to the madness that comes out of the uh, Trump administration. We have to say to them, if you want to be out, you stay out. time for the U.S. to stop seeing itself as a donor and recognizing itself as a polluter, a polluter who must pay, a polluter who must pay compensation and pay their ecological debt. This is not about charity. This is about justice. If we're looking at the amount that's been pledged, what we have is only between $18 billion to $34 billion. The worst part is $100 billion is not even close to what we need for climate finance. The amount that we need is in the trillions. We spent $13 trillion to bail the banks out during the financial crisis. We got sold out. Banks got bailed out. 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 These 21 plaintiffs representing the youth of America and future generations just took on the federal government and the fossil fuel industry and the Constitution will prevail. Federal defendants collectively and through the fossil fuel energy system are affirmatively depriving these young people of their rights to life, liberty, and property. Defendants argue that there is no federal public trust when the district court found that there was. And secondly, they argue that there should not be a newly recognized right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life. Plaintiffs also claim that their rights are being infringed with respect to recognized substantive due process rights, including their rights to personal security and other liberties also recognized I thought the government, by the Supreme Court. I thought the government was arguing that those rights don't exist. That they say there's no substantive due process right to having the government stop uh, what you claim is global warming. Well, Your Honor, so, so I, I, taking I, that I, argument, taking that argument. I think they're saying basically there's no claim at all. Is what I read the government's brief to be saying. There's no claim at all. It doesn't exist. There's no such cause of action. But I am not aware of any case that says the government is required to regulate so as to prevent harm caused by others. It's a systemic problem. And it's only through the Constitution and the public trust doctrine that we can address and come to a viable solution for these children's future. It is really extraordinary because plaintiffs seek 
unprecedented standing to pursue unprecedented claims in pursuit of an unprecedented remedy. According to plaintiff's complaint, virtually every single inhabitant of the United States has standing to sue virtually the entire executive branch to enforce an unenumerated constitutional right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life, and to enforce that right by means of a judicial order that defendants prepare and implement an enforceable national remedial plan to phase out fossil fuel emissions and draw down excess atmospheric CO2. Of course, CO2. the usual answer to all of that is, well, then they'll lose, or then you, there will, it will be reversed from appeal if they don't lose. The complaint is based on systemic affirmative infringements of the plaintiff's right by the but conduct some of, your of claim, the federal defense. Some of your claim is based on a, a fair amount of it, on the use of federal lands. That's correct, Your Honor. The federal defendants, the Department of Interior, primarily authorizes substantial extraction of fossil fuels from federal public lands, oil, gas, and coal. And the complaint actually sets forth the precise numbers f over decades that have been extracted and the number of leases granted. Order that defendants cease their permitting, authorizing, and subsidizing of fossil fuels an order for defendants to move to swiftly phase out CO2 emissions, an order to develop a national plan to restore Earth's energy balance, and then an order to implement well, but that But nobody's issued plan. an order like that. With respect, Your Honor, the district court itself, on page 52 of its order, called this case unprecedented. And the clearly meritless character of the claims asserted, I think, add up to really extraordinary case. If we look back on the 20th century, we can see that race and sex discrimination were the constitutional questions of that era. And when our great-grandchildren look back on the 21st century, they will see that government-sanctioned climate destruction was the constitutional issue of this century. They have sort of stray references to uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and John Locke's labor theory of, of value. But, you know, those things don't provide the basis for a constitutional right. We still have to find this constitutional right that you assert in order to give this remedy, do we not? This court does need to say there's a constitutional right at stake, but Your Honor doesn't need to find it because it's in the Constitution and the Fifth Amendment that the plaintiffs have fundamental rights to life and liberties. And the Supreme Court has already recognized that the liberties that we all hold include our right to bodily integrity and personal security and family autonomy. So this court doesn't need to step out of bounds and recognize any kind of new right. It can stick with the bedrock fundamental rights that well, we all have. Actually, to be fair, look, you're arguing for us to break new ground. You may be right. I'm sympathetic to the problems you, you point out, but you shouldn't minimize, you shouldn't say this is just an ordinary suit and all we have to do is follow A, B, and C and we get there. You're asking us to do a lot of new stuff, aren't you? We're asking the court to apply bedrock constitutional law and principles to a wholly new set of facts. You can take the right that they're trying to seek now, you can fashion a, a whole bunch of new rights. You could fashion a right to say, uh, that, look, we have concerns in America about lots of people dying from heart disease. One contributing factor in that is that, you know, the federal government isn't encouraging exercise enough. The federal government is subsidizing bad food that, you know, leads to an obesity epidemic. We want a structural injunction to review the actions of all executive branch agencies and Congress insofar as it has regimes to regulate that, you know, uh, issues that go to heart disease, issues that go to, to obesity. That's just unthinkable. That's a flat violation of the separation of power. It seems to me, why is it that the court can make a determination that obesity is different from something like a life-sustaining climate? In other words, what they're saying is every fundamental right unenumerated even that the court that the court has found before to be a constitutional right in terms of life and property etc all rest on what they've described as this constitutional right even though unenumerated 
So we would, the courts would have to decide that. Yes, it's new, um, but why doesn't it fit within comfortably within the nature of other unenumerated rights, such as the right to um, the right to an abortion, the right to bodily integrity, the right to marriage that the court has found exist in the life, liberty, and property rights of the Constitution, of the Fifth Amendment. They're far more smaller scale, right? You're talking about a group of people, um, you know, whether you're talking about prisoners or whether you're talking about people in a school district, it's a much more discernible, you know, and defined uh, problem. The defendants, they would be ordered to do this much like school districts and states were ordered to desegregate entire school systems. HUD was directed by the court along with state and local agencies to desegregate public housing. So whenever there's a government system that is causing such catastrophic infringement to fundamental rights, it is actually the duty of the court, starting with the district court, to issue a decree that can redress that constitutional violation. But can a state create a danger by failure to act? That's what I'm asking. I understand when the state goes out and puts a cone on the highway, and you run into it, they're responsible for it because they've created the danger. But your argument here is that the danger is created by the inaction of the federal government in these areas. No, I don't think the Fifth Amendment provides plaintiffs with a claim for pure inaction. But it does provide them a claim when the government has affirmatively acted to promote a fossil fuel energy system and to allow federal public lands to be extracted and to 20, almost 25% of U.S. emissions come from federal public lands. And when the federal government controls the system, facilitates it, subsidizes it, promotes it as it does, that creates a claim. So it's not the government's inaction here that you attack, it's the government's action? That the government devalues the lives of these young people when making decisions about energy policy and climate policy. So they value them less, and they value adults today more, and they are discriminated against because of that practice. I always like to ask people this, and you're writing the judgment. What does the judgment say? The judgment says that these defendants have violated these plaintiffs' Fifth Amendment rights to life, personal security. And must and therefore do what? And You're not asking for damages, so tell me what the relief is. So the decree, the injunctive decree that plaintiffs seek is for the defendants to use their existing authority and the planning mechanisms that are already in place to prepare a national energy plan that transitions the nation away from fossil fuel. The people are ready to lead. We, the people, are ready to Cause the White House making it hard to breathe. Cause the White House making it hard to breathe. All the oil men full of greed. All the oil men full of greed. You can never take away the people of the world standing here today. Thanks, Kadambari, for that. It's so brilliant to be able to see <clears throat> excuse me to be able to share a work of art all together <laughs> at once um, and i'm sure that there'll be lots to talk about in the q a um, but in juxtaposition with uh, that wonderful video we're going to move to the second paper in this panel which is from edward christie so I'm going to invite Edward to share his screen. Edward is a PhD researcher at University College London, based in the History of Art and Geography departments. His doctoral project works to align post-war art history with rising environmentalist movements. It highlights various sustainable ways of being that have been advocated by artists, which point towards holistic, and fundamental means of responding to the climate crisis. Today, he will be speaking on Agnes Dennis's Pyramid series. Um, so, Edward, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Theo. Um, I assume this is all working and you can see the PowerPoint and you can hear me. 
Absolutely, thank you. Great. Through a clearing in the scented pine forest, etched by two parallel tracks, probably formed by a quad bike, I see Agnes Dennis's tree mountain rising effortless, effortlessly from the plain ahead that's illuminated by the late afternoon sun. It's barely audible, but I hear a persistent rumbling sound coming from somewhere east of me towards the nearby village of Metzakaila. I decide the noise must be emanating from what remains of the Pincio gravel pits, which principally serve Finland's concrete manufacturers. It dawns on me that the extraction site would have once dominated my view, stretching a kilometre across. As I draw closer, the terrain's incline gradually increases and the tree's intricate arrangement, according to a formula derived from the golden ratio, becomes more apparent. Previously hidden curves and spirals emerge. My eyes trace the slope. The landscape swells upwards and outwards. Agnes Dennis has proclaimed that Tree Mountain represents the first time that an artist had been commissioned to restore environmental damage with an environmental work of art planned for this and future generations. A work of art that is global in scale, international in scope and unsurpassed in duration. The project manifests the artist's monumental ambition, which is reflected by the work's colossal dimensions and global significance. Tree Mountain was commissioned in 1992 by the United Nations Environment Programme and Finland's Ministry of the Environment to become an emblem of the nation's campaign to combat the escalating environmental stress that has defined modernity. Expanding this ownership, certificates of custodianship were publicly sold that offered by a sponsorship of one of the 11,000 trees involved in the project which would symbolize their contribution to humanity's commitment to the future well-being of the ecological, social and cultural life of the planet Earth. Linked to this, Tree Mountain also indexes Dennis's ethical ambition. She hopes that the 400 year lifespan of the pine trees which form the work will allow it to serve as a monument to the unity of human intellect and the majesty of nature, which will inspire the rise of a more ecologically minded civilization. More immediately, the project has involved the transformation of a gravel pit, which has healed the local environment. The land has been protected from erosion, the air quality has improved, and wildlife has returned. Tree Mountain is one of the most prodigious projects in Dennis's Pyramid series, an ongoing body of sculptural commissions and works on paper that was initiated in the late 1960s and explores the philosophical, mathematical and historical significances of pyramidal forms. It should already be apparent that Tree Mountain fundamentally involves interweaving ecological, artistic and scientific knowledge through the prism of a pyramidal structure and that it works to inspire more harmonious connections between humans and nature. In this paper, I take this perception further to argue that the value of the pyramid series as a whole lies in how it manifests a critique of modern humanist structures of knowledge, which drive human egocentrism and fuel the environmental crisis. Putting forward a replacement for this epistemology, the works represent modes of existence that prioritize critical engagement, generativity or an openness to change, and perception of the codependency of humans and non-humans within a planetary ecology. Three characteristics which lie at the core of what Dennis describes as ecologic, the meaning of which I hope will become clearer through the course of this paper. Through this argument, I challenge the existing academic discourse in the pyramid series, which maintains that the work should be understood as the results of Dennis's predominantly theoretical preoccupation with what is described as the paradoxical structures of knowledge. Instead, I argue that art historians have previously failed to fully acknowledge that the works are ultimately concerned with praxis. The pyramids encourage the formation of greener ways of being by interrogating the epistemological foundations of modern subjectivity and instead promoting ecological structures of thought. More broadly, through this paper, I aspire to exemplify what I believe is the main potential value of art history to challenging the climate crisis. 
as a discipline that involves the critical analysis and transformation of the conditions of subjectivity as expressly manifested in artworks. Artwork, art historians might support the emergence of a greener culture, which would constitute a fundamental and holistic response to climate change. While I mainly gesture towards the emergence of a green paradigm to define the development of art history as an academic discipline, my hope is that ideas pertaining to sustainability will determine the evolution of the wider art world, manifesting for, manifesting for example, in the continued popularization of exhibitions centered on ecology, covering the scope of art history, and increased engagement with environmental subjects within contemporary art practice. And I trust that this conference will continue to act as a forum to discuss the scope of these ambitions and will help to bring them forwards towards fruition. But now, to return to the focus of this paper, I'd like to draw your attention to a few key artworks in the Pyramid series, which I'll analyse to highlight how they critique modern humanist structures of thought and function ecologically to promote more sustainable ways of being. Dennis refers to the earliest works in the Pyramid series as the perfect pyramids, and these are built around the structure of a regular equilateral triangle. The group is epitomised by the human argument, a drawing which was originally rendered across 1969 and 1970, but which reappears as a component of several later works by the artist. The caption to the left side of the triangle explains that the contents of the shape develop according to a formula outlined in Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica, a treatise which concluded that the foundations of mathematics are the bases of rational processes of thought. However, although the combinations in the shape initially appear to make some sense, closer inspection reveals that the relationships between the formulae are actually incoherent and the contents become progressively complex and absurd down the triangle. Dennis has described the human argument as a satire and commentary on human self-importance, which alludes to her critical intentions for the work. While humanist epistemology emphasises humanity's ability to progressively clarify knowledge and master nature through directed logic, Dennis's manipulation of Whitehead and Russell's mathematics suggests the opposite is in fact true. Truth and understanding are progressively obscured, reasoning becomes illogical, the quest for progress which has defined modernity is provocatively posited as a movement towards stupidity. In the following works, the so-called restless pyramids, Dennis takes this critique of modern epistemology further by representing the reformation of the perfect pyramids towards becoming diverse organic forms, symbolizing the creation of ecological knowledge that is generative, heterogeneous and vitalized. The core of this transformation is depicted in When the Pyramid Awakens, study for an environmental sculpture. Like the human argument, this, this lithograph is based on an equilateral triangle, except in its pyramidal form. But here, the proportions that are foundational to the regularity or rigidity of the shape have been disrupted. The serpentine curves that writhe around the edges of each triangular face push the form's geometrical limits, and the arches of the base suggest the structure is about to levitate, an impression that is enhanced by the pyramid's peak that reaches beyond the page. While the human argument is starkly flat, the three-dimensionality of when the pyramid awakens is enhanced by the compression of the units that form the shape to produce tone and suggest contour. These generate a sense that the shape is alive, which is strengthened by the use of a vibrant cyan blue. While the dynamic form of the shape depicted in when the pyramid awakens signifies the freedom and energy that Dennis associates with ecological change, the significance of this transformation for environmentalism is more explicitly referred to by the work's subtitle, work subtitle, Study for an Environmental Sculpture. It could be argued that Dennis uses this name to indicate her intention to realise the shape as a sculptural object, akin perhaps to Tree Mountain. However, this seems unlikely as it would be impossible to physically produce the dramatic curvilinear form of the shape which almost seems to defy gravity as it stretches upwards. 
Instead, I'd like to suggest that the subtitle might be understood as an allusion to the much more broad and significant sculptural implications of the work. As a representation of eco-logic, it points towards the reformulation of humanity in favour of greener ways of being. The final stage of Dennis's pyramid series sees the kinetic energy that accelerates the restless pyramids lend the structures sufficient force to metamorphose into diverse organic forms that include eggs, snails, flying fish, birds and teardrops. These works are the most evolved iterations of ecologic. The assertive and rigid shapes of the perfect pyramids have transformed into an expansive range of architectural visions that imagine the harmonious integration of humans and nature through responsive and energized bonds. Half Bird, a flexible space station, for example, depicts a vessel based on a bird in flight that would house a community in space and be built from biological units that could transform in shape and repair themselves in the event of damage. Comparably, Snail Pyramid, study for a self-contained, self-supporting city dwelling, puts forward an alternative home for cities in which inhabitants would be cocooned within structures built as snail shells. Or Model for Teardrop, Monument to Being Earthbound, postulates the existence of humans within airborne buildings formed as droplets, which would be supported by magnetised connections with the earth. Although these works are commonly understood as utopian imaginings that do not concretely point towards realistic forms of green living, Dennis has commented that these structures have little of science fiction about them. Although this ostensibly alludes to Dennis's intention for the works to promote the realization of ecological ways of being, on viewing the future cities a few months ago, over 30 years after, after the majority of the works were produced, I was struck by their resonance with various ideas that are at the forefront of contemporary sustainable design. For example, by imitating natural shapes and structures, Dennis's future cities advocate biomimicry, the practice of learning from and mimicking strategies found in nature to solve human design challenges. To list just two prominent examples of research that have been based on biomimicry, Jeff Coates has led the development of a way of processing carbon dioxide to produce biodegradable plastics, taking inspiration from photosynthesis. And scientists have discovered that the pectoral fins of humpback whales, which feature bumps called tubercles, produce significantly less drag than the smooth shapes that are used for structures such as aeroplane wings and turbine blades, which has prompted their redesign. Secondly, Dennis's future cities advocate versatile architecture, built structures that respond to changes in the environment and social relationships. Dynamic approaches to design are becoming increasingly necessary as the climate becomes more volatile and human civilization becomes more precarious. And contemporary designers are accordingly drawing their focus more and more towards the potential of these lines of thought. Thomas Saraceno, for example, explores how humans might live more sustainably by transforming the principles which underpin our conceptions of housing and transport. These ideas were manifested, for instance, in his installation Stillness in Motion, Cloud Cities, which encouraged viewers to imagine how humans might live without fossil fuels in flexible airborne structures known as aerocenes, which would move according to prevailing wind directions. Similarly, through their Island House project, architects André Jacques and Patrick Crenn propose a structure that would collect and preserve rainwater, which in response to data gathered by sensors would be sprayed into the atmosphere to combat pollution and drought. These initiatives broadly align with the progressive green politics that characterize ecologic, which testifies to Dennis's significance as an artist and visionary. However, the future city's advocation that humans might, live to develop to, might develop to live in extraterrestrial environments conversely brings to mind space colonization projects led by corporate giants such as Elon Musk's SpaceX, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin. These initiatives are starkly at odds with ecologic as promotions of the continued development of modern capitalism based on its established trajectory. 
They advocate the expansion of human power over the environment, increased energy consumption, and support inequality as the projected high prices of interplanetary travel mean that merely the ultra wealthy will be offered a means of escaping the earth as it becomes increasingly inhabitable. A bias which is especially unfair given the world's richest 10% of people have been found to produce half of global carbon emissions. This fraught resonance exemplifies the vulnerability of environmentalist ideas to co-option by so-called green capitalists. Indeed, the commensuration of capitalism and environmentalism has come to define popular conceptions of sustainability, as its logic has pervaded the commercial landscape and government-led environmental strategies. For example, in 2009, President Barack Obama announced the American Recovery and Reinvestment Plan, which outlined unprecedented spending on green infrastructure and thereby positioned the capitalist economy as the principal field through which action against climate change should take place. This sparked the growth and popularization of the green marketplace as consumers sought to replace their carbon heavy products with greener alternatives, such as organic food, biofuels and electric cars. However, notwithstanding the merits of some of these products, capital growth continues to be widely prioritized over ethical concerns. And many of these supposedly green commodities are not what they promise to be. This is highlighted by Heather Rogers in her book, Green Gone Wrong, which exposes, for example, several major Western food retailers who source organic foods from developing countries to allow them to exploit cheap labor and lax environmental regulations. Likewise, Rogers reveals that major American motor car companies are limiting their investments in green vehicles because they are not currently profitable enough. Comparably, contradicting a report published by the state earlier this year, which claimed that the UK's greenhouse gas emissions are 43% lower than they were in 1990, Oxfam has exposed that the government has invested £6 billion into overseas oil and gas projects over the last decade. To challenge the failures of green capitalism, Rogers advocates more critical consumerism and a rethinking of the motivations of society to wholeheartedly prioritize sustainability over finance. To change course, we must create a new notion of growth. Meaningful transformation requires not just unconventional products, but the creation of an alternative logic where success was defined quite differently, she says. It is true that the political efficacy of the pyramid series might be undermined if the works were misunderstood as somehow sympathetic to corporate driven space colonization projects. However, following Roger's prompt, I'd like to suggest that the ambiguity of the works or their openness to diverse interpretations conversely encourages viewers attentive and critical engagement both with the works themselves and with the green initiatives that the pyramids bring to mind. On close inspection, the pyramid series reveals a commitment to a radical green politics that demands the dismantling of the epistemological foundations of one capitalism and thereby challenges the precedence of capital growth over sustainability, which frequently undermines the integrity and success of responses to the climate crisis. To replace this formulation of value, the works advocate the prioritization of existential fulfillment and ecological harmony, and thereby point towards an answer to the alternative logic which Rogers calls for. Since starting to prepare this paper, a news article has informed me that a billion people are estimated to be forced to flee their homes due to climate change by the end of the century. I've learned that China has returned to pre-COVID levels of air pollution, with, with experts predicting that Europe may follow. And meteorologists have announced that 2020 is expected to be the hottest year since records began. These are just some of the many reports on the worsening effects of the climate crisis, which make clear that the need to define and embody more sustainable ways of being is more pressing now than ever as is the necessity for the development of a critical and applied green art history. Thanks. So welcome to our final panel of the day. Um, and I'm gonna end on 
um, looking at these questions from a slightly different perspective. And I'm really, really thrilled that our first speaker, Emily, is here to join us. So I will invite Emily to share her screen whilst I introduce her. Emily Trad is currently working towards her MSc in Climate Change Science and Policy at King's College London. She has experience working in various sectors from renewable energy policy to sustainability in the built environment and corporate social responsibility. But her lifelong love of art and fascination with facilitating societal change has led her to focus her studies at King's on the communication of climate risk and drivers of behavior change. Her work utilizes principles of psychology, behavioral economics, and risk communication in the context of establishing effective responses to the current climate crisis. So Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you, Theo. Hi, everyone. Um, as Theo gave you a bit of my introduction, um, I just want to start today by sharing with you what I am currently working on. Um, so I'm writing my dissertation on examining art as a tool for communicating climate change and eliciting behavioral change, the psychology, efficacy, and the utilization. Um, and I want to start with a quote. Art and geography have been implicated in transformations in the ways we represent and conceptualize our world. Art is part of the practice of dwelling in and on earth. And this is something that I would like everyone to keep in mind as we discuss the interplay between art and the current climate crisis. And further, the responsibility of culture and society in changing these norms. I think that it's fair to assume that you all care about climate change, have some understanding of it, and as you've chosen to participate in this conference, an interest in addressing this global crisis. Throughout my education and my career thus far, I've continued to ask the question, how can we communicate climate change and elicit behavioral change from those who are not compelled by an abundance of scientific data or moral responsibility? What do we do when this is clearly not enough? This question has stud me to, led me to study environmental and natural resource economics in my undergraduate studies to speak the language of climate action to those compelled by monetary terms. I then worked in renewable energy and after that in environmental tech to speak the language of those prioritizing technological progress as a part of the matrix of climate solutions. This all led me to where I am now, studying the ways in which we can drive societal changes necessitated by the climate crisis. My work focuses less on the art itself and more on the understanding and behavioral impact of art. The current epoch is often referred to as the Anthropocene as it's the actions of humans past and present that have caused the geological changes we are now facing. Thus, in order to address climate change, societal change is critical. And in order to accomplish this shift, we first need effective communication of the problem and its solutions, both of which require cognitive, effective, and behavioral engagement. This means we need people to understand the information, care about that information, and be motivated and willing to act accordingly. It is only then that we can redefine social norms and practices. We must move beyond the status quo and accept new ways of life. I argue that art has an essential role in this process. Today, I'll be discussing this topic by addressing four broader questions as follows. What are the current barriers to climate communication? What makes art a useful instrument for climate communication? What elements of climate art are the most effective in communicating climate change? And is the use of art in conjunction with scientific information more effective in eliciting behavioral change? The first question, what are the current barriers to climate communication? Communicators of climate change have been puzzled by the gradual lethargy and persistent inaction despite increased awareness and expressed concern. I argue that this is in part due to the tendency towards the traditional information deficit model. Basically, the assumption that a well-informed public will take action. To ensure this well-informed public, communicators use ex expert information, sophisticated climate models, statistics, and so on. But as you know, and as you can see with these 
snapshots of just a couple of commonly used climate model graphics, there are limitations to this sort of communication. These limitations include climate science and terminology that is often inaccessible to lay audiences, climate science, oops, messaging, which presents a concept with little tangible visualization to most people. People still tend to view the climate change crisis as something that will affect people in far off places and is perceived on a time scale longer than one's lifetime, giving way to the dismissal of responsibility and a that won't happen here mentality. Unfortunately, as we know, it is generally the people who are primary, primarily responsible for climate change that have yet to feel its impacts firsthand. Therefore, the information does not relate to them on a personal level. There are also cultural limitations to traditional climate communications. When actionable solutions are indeed offered, they generally include a one-size-fits-all solution with little regard to specific cultural and social norms, further distancing people from the problem. There's also mental fatigue that people experience when hearing and seeing the same stories and information about climate change. Rhetorics of fear, negative messaging, and language like potential, future, and expected all drive uncertainty. The consequences of these limitations are immense, but ultimately they have resulted in inaction and apathy towards climate action. People are left asking, what can we do? This brings me to my second question. What makes art a useful instrument for climate communication? First of all, every person when engaging with information brings with them their own values, experiences, prior knowledge, personal epistemologies, and familiarity with climate change. These all influence their perception of risk and ability to act. One piece that is a missing is effective engagement. It is argued that people are more introspective when viewing art than they normally are. Therefore, art allows for this individuality by inviting effective engagement and personal connection to a piece. Furthermore, art can break down barriers of incomprehensibility and deliver familiarity through its heightened introspective state. Art can provide visualizations of risk, opportunity, catastrophe, new ways of life, and connectivity to the natural world. Climate art brings the topic of climate change out of the scientific or political realm and establishes it as a cultural reality. The climate crisis does not fit squarely in any subject matter or subsection of life. It will affect every aspect of the human experience and needs to be recognized as such. I'd also like to point out that I'm talking about climate action, climate art, sustainable norms, et cetera, being present in museum spaces, cinemas, music festivals, calling for art as a catalyst for normalizing sustainable behavior and conveying necessary information, communicating imagined futures. Much of what I have discussed thus far can be summed up in a quote I've read and that I love by a woman named Marta Kern. Artists can scream, scientists can't. There's a constant scrutiny that scientists and climate experts face. Their research and knowledge is questioned for bias, political motive and accuracy. It is argued that they should not practice, practice activism and instead should serve solely as providers of information. Artists are not bound by such restrictions. They can use emotion and narrative to move people and convey information that scientists cannot. To further understand this topic, I am conducting current research that seeks to answer the following questions. What psychological principles outlined in the literature are works of climate art utilizing? What, what, psych, what psychological principles of climate art are the most effective in communicating climate change and eliciting behavioral change? And is the use of art in conjunction with scientific information more effective in eliciting this behavioral change? I want to point out that for the purposes of my research, I'm defining climate art as any artwork that explores climate change, whether through explicit depictions of climate destruction, abstract displays of dystopic futures, or like the piece below, the use of metaphor. The installation I've included below is by Saigo Chung and shows 99 wolves running toward and then violently crashing into a transparent barrier. They then proceed to line up and repeat the act. This work provides a poignant metaphor for humanity's cyclical history of soaring forward headfirst into self-destruction. My first question, what psychological principles outlined in the literature are works of climate art utilizing? I'm categorizing the themes of psychological principles being used in contemporary works of climate art. These range from dystopic and post-apocalyptic motifs explicitly depicting men's destruction, 
such as Alex Rockman's Gowanus showing the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn, one of the United States' most polluted bodies of water, a work in which he worked closely and consulted with scientists before creating. It also ranges to works highlighting consumerism and waste to metaphors of our conscious ignorance and prioritization of capitalism, such as the piece below called The Banker, in which Jason DeCaris Taylor has built artificial reef sculptures of bankers with their heads in the sand, a metaphor that doesn't need much explaining. By first identifying which principles are being employed, which emotions being tapped into, and then analyzing the effectiveness of each, I'll better understand how climate art can maximize its impact. The project I'm currently working on sets out to answer the following two questions. What psychological principles of climate art are the most effective in communicating climate change and eliciting behavioral change? And is the use of art in conjunction with scientific information more effective in eliciting such change? To answer these questions and to quantify the efficacy of climate art, I've developed the following me methodology. I've designed a survey based on an interactive online, online climate art exhibition hosted by Artworks for Change called Our Ecological Footprint, Putting the Bill. Initially, I initially planned on surveying several in-person exhibitions throughout London, but in light of COVID, I'm using an online exhibition, which is incredible and because it's online is accessible to most, making universally, universally relevant information accessible. Um, this exhibition combines beautiful artwork with ample information and the ability for attendees to pledge specific actions. This will allow for me to examine not only the emotive and cognitive response to climate art, but the benefit of combining both art and scientific information and its impact on behavioral engagement. Past studies have shown that imagery plays a role in either increasing a sense of importance of an issue such as climate change, its saliency, or in promoting feelings of being able to do something about climate change, self-efficacy. But few have shown that images can do both. Studies have also suggested that climate art would be more effective if it promoted self-efficacy and presented implementable solutions. To build on this research, I'm using the exhibition which combines both climate art and scientific information with implementable solutions thus addressing cognitive, affective, and behavioral levels of engagement. To conduct this research, I'm assigning each participant to one of three sets of instructions. Group A is asked a series of survey questions regarding their understanding of and stance on climate change prior to visiting the exhibition. They're then asked to explore the exhibition before answering a few follow-up questions regarding their experience. Group B is asked the same initial survey questions and follow-up questions, but instead of visiting the exhibition in its entirety, they're just shown the works of climate art without the accompanying text. Group C is also asked the same initial survey, but they are then only shown the accompanying text without the art. They're then asked the follow-up questions that relate to behavioral change and understanding of climate change. By analyzing the result, results of this exercise, I will accomplish my ultimate research goal to offer an enhanced understanding of the effective methods for communicating climate risk and driving societal change in response to the climate crisis. If art can be used to increase the effectiveness of climate communication and elicit behavioral change by disrupting social norms, giving people an emotional connection to the topic and driving introspection, it will benefit all. Every person, every institution has a role in climate action and shaping the future of humanity. We can use art to make it a beautiful one. I want to conclude by expressing my gratitude for your attendance and participation and by inviting you all to participate in this survey if you are interested. For those of you that would like to participate or to discuss this topic further, I've included my contact information here and I've also included the link to the online exhibition, which I encourage you all to check out. Thank you. Many thanks, Emily, many, many thanks. Um, it's so good to have you here. Um, so we're gonna to move to the final presentation, but I'm gonna introduce our final speaker now. So Benedict Ramad holds a PhD in art philosophy and art history from the Université of Paris. Uh, Pantheon Sorbonne in the from 2013 about the misfortunes 
of ecological art in the US since the 1960s. And this dissertation is to be published in French by Presse du Real in 2020. An art historian and critic specializing in contemporary art, she focuses mainly on environmental issues related to climate change and animal studies. In addition to contributing to various magazines, she has curated exhibitions and edited the accompanying catalogues. Her most, her shows include Apparaître, Disparaître at the Foundation Grantham pour l'art et l'environnement in 2019 on the sixth extinction and the global loss of the Anthropocene and the edge of the earth by Black Dog Publishing on climate change during the Anthropocene, presented at the Ryerson Image Centre in Toronto in 2016. She is a lecturer in the Department of Art History and Film Studies at the Université de Montréal since 2013. And Benedict's paper today is called Beyond Representation, Sounds of Climate Change. So take it away. Thank you, Theo. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about sound artworks, but unfortunately the Zoom technology is incompatible with the technology to make you listen to these pieces. So, this lecture will be based on descriptions. This paper has been conceived during the quietest time the earth has ever known since the Industrial Revolution. The global lockdown due to COVID-19 had an eloquent effect on our everyday life. It became silent. Correction, the absence of our sonic nuisance, named anthropophony by artist Brenny Krauss, made able to hear the density and the richness of natural sounds in the city. Bird songs, insects buzzing, wind, our more silent way of living demonstrated how deaf we are in the normal life, incapable of listening to the complexity of the sound of the earth. What would be, though, the sound of climate change? As Brandon Labelle, professor of new media at the University of Bergen in Norway, mentions it, sound has a strong agency with superior qualities as it is invisible. It can be disruptive and effective, and most of it, the unseen nature of sound can support a political transformation. And that specific qualities are exactly what climate change need to reach another level of awareness and political efficiency to the public. For until now, climate change has been almost exclusively mediated by visual record in which statistical graphic systems have a virtual monopoly to report on climate change with extensive synthesis of data, visual translation through curves, crooked, ascending, descending, and above all, increasingly steep curves and a complex chromatic system. Numbers, the reality of climatic disorders literally suffocates under the nervous, an avalanche of numbers. According to climatologist Joachim Schellnuber, the main pitfall of this form of visualization lies in the fact that, quote, in the highly regulated framework of scientific practice, there was no space for scientists' emotional reactions, such as fear, to the findings. Such emotions had to be assiduously suppressed when making scientific statements and so do I, my emotions are inhibited in front of statistic patterns. Statistical images cool down the subject and by being related more to the text than to the image, they are more rational than emotional. The superior objectivity of statistic images has the damaging effect of distancing the subject from the spectator rather than encouraging an emotional a physical connection. The visual primacy remains in our Western societies and the aesthetics of data 
does not manage to go beyond a statistical canon that remains attached to reading and learning, an almost pedagogical relationship that does not renew our perception. In the field of environmental photography, images of animals in distress, among which the polar bear largely dominates, images of climatic disasters, deluge, floods, droughts, Gigantic fires saturate media coverage alongside views of smoky industrial landscapes, aerial shots, or desperate population. Sorry. The canons of environmental photography were established at the dawn of the expansion of environmentalism in our Western societies in the 1970s and have not really changed. We are practically at the same point politically. Some artists have tried to break away from this with the rise of the Anthropocene, but so far new forms of environmental art have been rather diffuse. The use of photography can evolve, as evidenced by the portraits of flooded people taken by Gideon Mendel and brandished on placards by the Extinction Rebellion's demonstrators at protests in London and Nemo in 2019. The humanity depicted was heard through a community that transformed into visual slogans, tipping them into a completely unusual use. The portraits of climate victims from India, Great Britain, Brazil, and Nigeria in particular, were activated in this case with unexpected amplitude held by British and Belgian citizens who gave substance to a unique Anthropocene photogra photography. But I have to say, this is an exception. So what operational strategy could bring the art of climate change into a new era of political relevance? What the Anthropocene requires from us is to assume her humanity, to assume our anthropocentrism to regain an environmental agency. The Anthropocene hero is shaking up our paradigms, forcing us to assume full responsibility for our humanity's actions. This is why the spectator has to be active, experiencing his or her own responsibility in the hyper phenomenon of climate change. Horrific pictures or moral lessons are useless and ineffective from my perspective. A large part of Western humanity has instigated the Anthropocene era. Events can no longer be independent of us, but are linked to our presence, our history. Sound and music can stimulate something highly intuitive for visitors rather than pervade a didactic visit from which they must draw facts, causing the images to act more like evidence than artworks. Quote, what we do need are resources that help us embody and make sense of this volatile climate events and subjectivities, end of quote, write Michelle Comstock and Mary Hawks. Embodying while listening, that's my point. With the recorded sound of nature and music produced by the data generated by climate change, a process named sonification. The visual is retrograded to give way to a more embodied type of perception, an incorporation of the subject through its listening. Thus, artists adapt sound, often presented in immersive installations plunged in darkness, to optimize listening through a physical experience that retrogresses the view to a secondary stage. This allowed to address on a sensitive and almost physiological level the questions related to climate change. In a political approach that Jonathan Gilmore defines under the label ecological sound art. I open the quote, using sound as medium not just raise awareness of ecological issues, 
but to help us to understand them from new perspectives, relate to them in new ways, and reconnect with them in ways that might just help motivate us to act." End of quote. Gilmeray situates the emergence of this practice in the early years of the millennium, when recordings of disappearing soundscapes began, began the be, to be broadcast in art spaces in order to raise public awareness of the phenomenon of global warming. These were mostly recordings of glacier in Greenland and Iceland, calving and thus melting, disappearing. This is the first modality of eco-sound art, to record and broadcast the sound of life, uh, the sound of the life of organisms, animals, insects, plants, or their complex habitats, but also of climatic phenomena in order to make people think about the sixth extinction or climate upheavals, for example. Bernie Krauss is one of the pioneers in this field. He began in the, light, in the late 60s to record single specimens at first and then gradually build up a collection of complex recordings of habitats, preceding by successive layers of sounds some of which are not audible to the human ear. Krauss collected several thousand hours of recordings, more than 15,000 animal specimens, 50% of which are not considered extinct. These archives of soundscapes are studied by scientists, of course, but are also exploited in two ways by Krauss. During conferences, the didactive and comparative mode dominates sound broadcast and the projection of spectrograms, which help to visualize the sounds by the figuration of the Hertz waves and their amplitude. On a scientific level, sound must indeed be analyzed and explained because it is not natural for us. But the use of diagrams and these curves cool down perception. The sound resource is made passive by this approach. This is less the case in installation mode where it is activated and has a stronger agency. Here at the Cartier Foundation and then London and Milano, seven ecosystems were composed by Krauss and designed by United Visual Artists, a group from London. I say composed because it is an assemblage of multiple recordings of specimens and places, of biophonic, the sounds of living things, and geophonic, the sounds of inert elements and weather conditions. Two components greatly affected by climate change. It is a mixture of temporalities too, since in order to reconstruct an ideal soundscape, Krauss drew from recordings of different periods, mixing different places. So, it's not a documentary reconstruction, but a 12-minute composition. For the ocean cycle, for example, a sound montage features coral reefs, mangroves, sea trenches, mammals, seabirds, corals, recorded between 1980 and 1995 between Hawaii, Canada, New Zealand, California, and the Caribbean, as well as fish recorded in fish tanks. The here and now of the experience is combined with the historical dimension of these environments, some of them forever changed by human presence and activity, or completely destroyed, reduced to silence now. And with the artificial dimension of this montage that projects us into an ideal recomposed future. These three temporalities are, are quite symptomatic of the Anthropocene and its particularly elusive time scale, which is why ecological sound art represents a very accurate formulation 
for our era that is so difficult to grasp. But visualization proposed here is not confined to a single use of spectrographs and intensity curves close to an aesthetics of the data, but shapes a sensitive experience exacerbated by darkness, chromatic saturation, and the presence of water, as you can see here, reflecting both the curves. And that's important to amplify visually the acoustic vibrations through rings on the water. As Angelisch Obrist mentions, Bernie Krause's approach has an emotional aesthetic dimension. And this, in my opinion, is not simply a matter of wonder at this unspoiled nature or grieving of its disappearance. It's a political emotion linked to the intimacy of a subject, the way of feeling it more intimately through the darkness, less intellectually and more physically. As the sound surrounds us, there is no more objectivity centralized by the vision. Emotions and feelings are at their highest. As Bernie Krause says, quote, seeing is analytical and reflective. Sounding is active and generative. One might say that everything in the world was created by sound and analyzed by vision. If I wish to change the world, I must become a visionary. But if I wish the world to change me, I must learn to listen." End of quote. Jacob Kierkegaard, in his 2015 ISFO installation in uh, Copenhagen, had also plunged the spectators into darkness and surrounded the room with 14 speakers and subwoofers in order to amplify the low waves produced by the sound of the falling ice, falling ice in the Arctic and transmit them to the wall body in order to feel the Arctic melting accelerated by the rising temperatures. Putting space in darkness accentuated this attention to hearing and feeling more than to looking and the personal thus is getting more political in this situation. The French philosopher Jacques Rancière also denounces the vision as too hierarchical because it forces a certain political passivity. For Rancière, in his essay about the distribution of the sensible, the hierarchy between intellect and sensibility must be subverted in order to reach a new and effective political meaning. This kind of experimentation with sound seems to me critically important to free ecological artworks from the principles of duty and literal description that have governed it since the outset. Sound and music-free exhibition, artworks and spectators from moral expectations to address more ethical perspectives. As ethics is related to individuals and their affects, and morality is related to the society and human beings. I firmly believe that ecological art has to develop this very subjective call, building up a relationship with the spectator through sound art. Judy Twett, a climate data sound artist, also lamented by teaching about the environment, and environment tended to overwhelm her students depressing them and making them anxious, freezing their ability to act. She decided to convert data, such as 30 year records of Arctic temperatures and melting ice level, a litany of numbers into musical notes and to compose a piano score in order to render this information in a more sensitive form. Without knowing the details of the numbers, the spectator can perceive in the course of the play that the note played by the right hand sink into the low notes while the left hand play notes that gradually abandon harmony. Twet proposes a pure sensitive situation that allows the, the audience to feel the problem of global warming emotionally, to perceive the progressive disharmony 
the disintegration of certain musical phrase. The Anthropocene is not a catastrophic era. It's our new order, certainly dilapidated, problematic, and that threatens the living. Ecological sound art, by proposing an immersion, a fusion with sound, allows us to expose ourselves to see to these statistical extremes by appealing to the sensible. No more question of remaining sheltered as with the sublime, an aesthetic that most often involved in, with the Anthropocene. We must apprehend the Anthropocene through emotions and order not to be overwhelmed by this era and to be able to act. Today, silence has returned to our cities, the silence of the natural elements. Biophony and geophony are already inaudible because of the anthropophony generated by our deconfined activities. The life-giving silence of a pandemic has reverted to the silence of death, the silence of irreversible loss. Brendan Labelle, come to, back, to come back to him, identifies four modes of sonic agency, one of which is the invisible mode. Quote, the invisible looks at, at how the unseen quality of sound may be mobilized as a basis for emancipatory practices, end of quote. This is the strategy of silence chosen by Cathy Patterson, whose rec records of melting glaciers have been pressed into three records, then cast and frozen, using the water from three Icelandic glaciers from the very water of the melting caused by global warming. She played with this until they melted and shot a video of the process until it was silent. Today, the Italian authorities have almost finished covering a glacier with white sheets to prevent it from melting completely. And temperatures in the Arctic have broken all the records for warmth. 38 degrees Celsius yesterday in Siberia. These ecological sound artworks may soon resound like toms in our body. Thank you.